Welcome back. Again, my name is Lynn Manning John, and I'm the vice principal here at Hawaii Heat Combined School. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about place, going back to uh, Dr. Brayboy's presentation. Um, the Duck Valley Indian Reservation was established in 1877 as the permanent home of the Western Shoshone people. Um, however, in a very brave act of sovereignty at that time and self-determination, um, the Western Shoshone bands that were scattered throughout the Great Basin stayed in place, which if you're from the state of Nevada, and spe specifically northern Nevada, you'll hear the misnomer of Indian colonies up and down the 80, <laughs> because the Western Shoshone band stayed in place. They did not remove from their um, origins to come to um, this place, Duck Valley. Um, my band, Miss Hernandez's band, the Dosawihi, the White Knife Band, did come here. And this is where the Dosawihi Band continues to be. We are still here and have been continuously since that time. Um, the Northern Paiute um, people had this as part of um, our ancestral land as well. And so um, later in the 1800s, um, the Northern Paiute people came to the same place. The reservation was extended onto the Idaho side. And we continue to exist here today as the modern Duck Valley Shoshone Paiute tribes organized under the Indian Reorganization Act of 1835. Um, and we are one tribe, one tribal government made up of two different ancestral tribes, the Western Shoshone and the Northern Paiute. So um, today, most people here are both. Um, and we, I, I believe, coexist um, united. We exist united, we're, we're to here together. Um, our school, so traditionally and currently, when a baby comes into the world, we put them into a cradle board, and learn, that's where learning starts, in the cradle board. The cradle board could be propped up so that an infant could even observe the world and see what life is like and what their role is. Um, and they're educated that way traditionally. Now with the onset of schooling, <laughs> came boarding schools, and boarding schools did affect our community. Uh, we had a lot of tribal children removed from this community to be educated in different spaces and places, including the infamous Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. And more often, though, the Stewart Indian Boarding School, located outside of Carson City, um, which closed in 1980. So this is not ancient history. It is um, recent. <laughs> Um, this school though, and this community um, had day schools. And the day schools were established throughout the community. And depending on where you lived, you attended maybe like a one room schoolhouse located throughout um, the Duck Valley Indian Reservation. Uh, in the 1930s or so, a school was established called the Swain School. The Swain School um, educated children from throughout the valley who were then brought into one space. The Swain School, reorganized and became the Owyhee School, which is where you're sitting. <laughs> um, established originally by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, Bureau of Indian Education, this wing that you can see out here along the west side of um, our structure here is the original building. It was built in the 1950s-ish. We really don't know. Um, but it has all of the beautiful features of a 1950s school. <laughs> and then little by little, they added wings, including the wing that we're sitting in, which is the farthest room from the boiler, which is why it's cold in here. And so if people who are not um, here don't know that half of our participants are still wearing their coats. So because it's cold in here and this is the way we exist. I went to this school. I started kindergarten here um, and I eventually graduated from this school. But generations of Duck Valley residents have come through this school. We have approximately 300 students today, um, most of whom are Shoshone Paiute or some mixture of Shoshone Paiute. I think we have a scattered one or two students, maybe max five, who aren't native at all. Um, we are, if you are non-native, you are a minority here. <laughs> if you are um, a tribe other than Shoshone Paiute, people will say, oh, what tribe are you? Oh, you're Crow, you're, you know, Navajo, or people are mixed, though. Um, and we're many different things. Um, because of the conditions of our school, which is 
what you are all experiencing today. Um, during the 2013 Nevada legislature, uh, the governor signed a bill that provided $65 million to, for the construction of a new school. So we are only gonna be here for about two more years before our new school is built about three miles up the road. So modern, <laughs> flushable toilets uh, that don't leak, you know, like roots not in, the, in all of our spaces. Like we will have a modern school that also doesn't carry the baggage that this school does. Um, this school, there are staff out here who are going to be helping you with your lunch that have pencil tips embedded in their scalps from the teachers who stabbed them with pencils when they spoke their language. Um, the Elko County School District just last year, about this time, rescinded a, a policy that forbade, forbade um, the speaking of Shoshone and Paiute in our language or in our school. So my mom, who is a teacher here, who you met earlier, you know, she as an as an employee of this school um, couldn't speak her language in this building legally or until last year. So <laughs> these are very real and relevant and valid and continuing issues that we encounter here all the time. Um, here, um, we like, I like to believe um, being native is value added. It is not a deficit. Um, the 100 miles you all came this morning has protected and preserved our language and culture and traditions. Uh, and as a product of this community and this school, you know, I can attest to the, what I was told growing up. Um, even though education has a bad taste for a lot of Native people, um, I was always told from my family, but also community members, go out, get educated, gain experience, and come back and help your community. And that is what we tell our kids today. <laughs> get educated, go out and get lots of experience, and come back and help your community. Education is a tool. We have students today uh, throughout the United States. Uh, my own daughter attends Tufts University, who she learned about by doing a science project on indigenous knowledge. She demonstrated how our traditional plant medicines can kill cancer cells. And that is how she became <laughs> uh, a student at Tufts, long story short, we have students at UNLV. So, and I am myself, am a grad of UNLV. Um, I do want to introduce though, and have uh, the presentation shift to one of our teachers. Her name is Christina Hernandez. Um, most of our community members do not call her Christina. Um, her name is Tonikia or Toe, um, which in our language is a flower. And so, um, Miss Hernandez is, she does go by Miss Hernandez, but most often she goes by Toe. <laughs> Her name is Toe. <laughs> and so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Miss Hernandez to share with you one of the ways in which in our building we are normalizing and uh, making an integral part of our curriculum um, indigenous knowledge. So go ahead, Miss Hernandez. Hey. Hello, everybody. So, um, See Tonika. Lucy is Christina. Um, professional name. If you're trying to look me up, the chances of you finding Christina are probably a lot easier than finding uh, Tonika. Um, so I am from here. Um, head Start for two years, kindergarten, 12th grade. I think I spent a total of like five years off the reservation. And that was just to go and get my. Um, bachelor's degree at Boise State. Um, I got my master's degree at the University of Idaho, which has this really, really specifically unique program that I was um, able to be a part of, the Indigenous Knowledge for Effective Education program. Um, so here's some, uh, ooh, missing a slide, okay. Um, here is my brother, who's also a teacher, um, a few, miles from here, Wells, it's not a few miles, it's a, like 150. <laughs> My brother is also a product of the I Keep um, program at the University of Idaho, and it prepares and certifies culturally responsive indigenous teachers to meet the unique needs of Native American students, K through 12. I Keep scholars are a part of an, an indigenous cohort um, committed to the innovation of indigenous education. 
So um, here is the model that we kind of use throughout th our time there. But I'm going to go back this way. And if you have, I'm going to do such a teacherly thing. And uh, um, if you could just take one of these and pass it down. And then we'll take one of these and pass them this way. They're just pencils. <laughs> Don't let it snap your finger. Um, I'm going to catch up to this pile. Um, um, and if everyone out you back there could, once you get your paper, we're going to fold it into quarters. You guys want to, you guys want to play with us? Is this your water? Yes. Okay. And hopefully Mostly, we all have something to write on. OK, um, so let's do the top left corner. You, you go ahead and open it up. Um, we're going to do the top left corner. I want you guys all to draw a roach, a roach. And I remember, I'm not, this is what I tell my students all the time, I'm not asking for you to uh, draw the Mona Lisa, I just want some effort. <laughs> so if you draw a roach in whatever, whatever abilities you have artistically, that's great, that's all I want. I just want effort, that's it, that's it. Yep, top left. Well, uh, will you guys still be able to see it if I pull something up uh, on like the internet? Is that okay? Uh, okay. 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 Um, if you're ready to move on, in the right top right corner, let's do a fan. A fan. Yep. Top right, we'll do a fan. Mm -hmm. like, not going to tell you. <laughs> a fan. Um, okay, so bottom right, we'll do a, ro oh, I did the roach, uh, a bustle. The bottom right, I want you to draw a bustle. 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 A bustle.
And then the last one, I might be rushing this one. In the last one, go ahead and draw a breastplate. 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 Okay, and let's see, is that box around here? We'll just send this back around to collect these. Um, unless, if you really want to keep them, that's fine. I'm not a stickler, give me back my pencils. <laughs> but I do, but I do, I do want that box, so don't walk away with that box. <laughs> Okay, so I'm not typing. So, did you guys draw a roach? Did you guys draw a roach? No. Is this what you guys drew? No. Okay, so you guys drew a roach. Because this is a roach. In my context, this is a roach. It's made out of porcupine hairs, and um, they're a lot bigger and colorful in, uh, with development of synthetic fibers and all of these things. And the males wear them on their head during a lot of cultural events. Um, what was the next one? Fan. Okay. Did so you guys draw a fan? No, no one drew. A fan. Oh, not this kind of fan, but uh, like, <laughs> like these, this fan, this fan. Okay, okay. This is what we also use in a lot of our other uh, ceremonies. Um, and did you guys draw a bustle? Bustle. A bustle. The men wear them when we also uh, when they dance. This is my, this, I'm biased, my family, the boys in my family are this kind of dancer. Um, might see. So it's a fancy dancer. Yep, that's a fancy dancer. And I have to be specific with this. And this is uh, a different type of bustle. So um, the last one. Oh, actually, I'm kind of scared to Google this one. Okay, breastplate. <laughs> breastplate um, made out of um, pipe, buffalo pipe bones or um, dentelium, little tiny shells. Okay, so when I told you guys to draw these things, um, what we understood was very different. I knew exactly what I was talking about. Miss Yolanda, did you know what, exactly what I was talking about? Miss Pete, did you know exactly what I was talking about? Okay, so cultural context um, is a lot different. And then, then um, that goes into my speaking of representation. So I grew up here, and I love it here, did all the schools. But when I think about the representation that I had as a student in my own home, it wasn't that great. Like, um, I could think of two things. Most vividly is the rough face girl. We all know this story, right? It's the Cinderella, Native American Cinderella story. Um, and then I want to say I was a junior in high school. Um, my teacher had us read Prison Writings by Leonard Peltier. And that was like the closest, like, it's just his autobiography of um, his, not adventures, his his life, and then um, how he ended up where he is at the moment. So um, those were kind of the only stories where I was sort of present. Um, 
and this always like, I don't know if you guys watch John Leguizamo's stand up, but it's a little bit more profane than what I've put up here. And, um, but when he said this, I was just like, oh my gosh, you, if you don't see yourself represented outside of yourself, you just feel invisible. And for a Colombian man in New York to say this, I was like, wow, that is, that's a different one. Um, and then, uh, so this is something I kind of go off when I think of what I want to do in my uh, classroom. So Yaso's cultural wealth um, has different types of capital to reach. Um, aspirational, are we supporting the maintenance and growth of the students' aspirations? Linguistic, how are we supporting the language and communication strengths of our students? Familial, um, how do we recognize and help students draw on wisdom, values, stories from their home communities. Social, how do we help students stay connected to the communities and individuals, um, instru and individu individuals instrumental in their previous educational success? Um, navigational, how do we help students navigate our institutions and their interactions at these institutions? And um, resistance, how do we support who are uh, committed to engaging and serving their home communities. So um, everything that I'm about to show you all falls back to Yasso's cultural wealth. Um, one of the things we do in class is in American literature, which is uh, 11th grade. Before we do anything, I don't even hand out textbooks yet, we talk about the creation stories um, but out of the over 500 tribes in the United States, the student has to pick one. I, I, but it can't be any in Nevada or in Idaho because we circle back around that um, later. Um, if you are unaware, Idaho is a four or five miles north of here. So a lot of the things I say, um, we, we, go, we could do both Idaho and Nevada. Um, so they, they have to pick one tribe in the whole country um, and we can't have, uh, since we have like 15, 20 students, well, this year we will have more, but um, it, I have to make sure no one, like two aren't doing the Blackfeet tribe. Um, so students are gonna research the tribe's past and present. What, did, what were they like? What did they go through? Um, what are they doing now? What does it look like for them now? Um, and the creation stories to these tribes must be included. Um, going back to the onto ontologies. And then once we finish that, um, we go into our local Shoshone Paiute tribe. And I have a book that has a bunch of stories. I read it, and just like you, we, I love to make the kids draw. Um, so I read and they illustrate. So this is some of the results um, of that. And they're, every year they'll hang up for the entire year in my classroom. Um, in 10th grade, we right off the bat go over Gothic literature. And as soon as we cover the odds and ends of what consists of this genre of Gothic literature, we talk about how would this look like if we were, if it was res Gothic literature. I already have all these things in my mind, but I make them. If you have a mansion, that's old and creaky, what's our equivalent to that? And you'll see we have a lot of like just old, I don't wanna say like jalopies, because they're really important to us. <laughs> um, and then that drives us to the next one, which is Nunit stories. And in our, in our language, Nunit means like the monster story. So we're learning about what these, because the kids love being scared. So they go home, the assignment, they go home to whomever in their family, they need to record. And I, they're like, oh, I don't wanna show my face. It's okay, they don't need to show their face. They could, I just need, it could be of the ceiling. I need to hear your voice. I need to hear whomever you're talking to's voice. They come back, they turn it into a transcript and we turn that transcript into a narrative. So, um, and then I have like, a running anthology of all these stories. Some of them are from here, some of them are from surrounding tribes, but um, it gets them pushing these questions and these stories to come out of their families. Um, and then we also study other Nunit stories. So we have um, Joy Harjo's poem, 
Wendigo. And again, I read it, and they illustrate exactly how they see. Um, elder biography stories is something I hold near and dear to my heart. Um, I will pass these out. This is the assignment page. You can take one and pass it down. Um, uh, the, the students, so I don't have grandparents, and my sister, who is just graduated two years ago, did this assignment. She also just didn't have grandparents. So um, I call it just an elder story. You go home, you preferably to your grandparents, but not all of us have those, so they just find an elder. Over the years, I've, uh, you might say, see on there, not Colleen. We have some people who like, uh, students like to run to for like an easy way out. Um, so they go out, they have a list, the list of questions for them to ask is on the second page. Um, they have all of these things they have to, to a process they have to go through. Again, you have to have the recording. Um, you have to make the transcript. You turn that transcript into a biography. And then, um, again, I just have a running collection of elder biographies. Uh, we'll, <coughs> you'll see some of it. I encourage you to take a tour of my classroom. They're hanging on the walls. Um, in step one, when you're on the interview, you'll see that it says that the elder is giving you something. So in return, you give something back. I usually have an attachment to my favorite chocolate chip, chocolate chip cookie recipes, but they're encouraged to do anything. Um, a small gift is just the token of appreciation. And let's see if this video works. And this is just, I'm scared to get it out. There's no sound. Uh, and I was so excited I couldn't speak uh, properly, so. And right now it's going to play. OK, um, in eighth grade, we talk about the Holocaust. It's in the textbook. We all talk about Anne Frank and the Mouse comic uh, graphic novel. Um, but after we wrap that up, we wrap up your Europe's Holocaust, we come back and talk about a more local Holocaust. Um, in this historical fiction novel by Tim Tingle, uh, how I Became a Ghost. It's also a series. There's more to it. We only, ha we only have read this one. Um, the children, immediately the first chapter talks about treaties. So my eighth graders are like surface level treaties is what they're gonna, they want to know. Just, it's, it's very complex, but we learn surface level treaties. Um, they learn about the treaties in Nevada. We learn about the treaties in Idaho, what that could possibly mean. Um, then we go on to learn about continuously the Trail of Tears. Um, we talk about boarding schools and smallpox and everything. All of that is uh, wrapped in this 100-page uh, uh, historical novel. Once upon a time, I had electives, not this year, um, but once upon a time I had an elective class and we called it Native American Literature. Um, one of the books we read is Trail of Lightning by Rebecca Roanhorse. Um, again, we go, we learn about the tribe that it takes, that it uh, centralizes in. Um, again, we're learning about boarding schools because this is set in dystopian, uh, the future, it's dystopian. Um, so we learn about the effects of boarding schools and the characters, even though it's in the future, are still having this like running effect of boarding school. Um, uh, one year, my students, I let my students do a project on their final for this, and this student uh, made this cake, and everything on top of his cake is a, has something to do with the novel. Um, another student learned to make fry bread for the first time from her mom, um, and one of the characters, he focuses a lot on coffee. Coffee is a hot commodity, very, uh, you can't find it a lot in the future. 
So he had coffee, they made beans and fry bread, and she made this for her final project. Um, another year, when we were learning about other tribes, I had a Filipino student who happened to live in North Dakota for a little bit. Um, she did her presentation on the, M the Hadatsa tribe, and she spoke Hadatsa. So, and then she moved here and was just like schooling us in her Hadatsa language. It was really cool. <laughs> um, in world literature, they study Beowulf. It's thick, it's dense, a lot of hard things to understand. But at the end of Beowulf, we break it down. What did Beowulf look like if it were Resi? What would Beowulf look like as an indigenous, um, as an indigenous story? So the kids again illustrate what Beowulf would look like in, as an indigenous story. Um, we have the overbearing basketball mom. Um, it's, it's there's qu they're, they're quite comical. Some of them are fighting about aunties and fry bread. It's uh, it's great. We also um, for the senior class we have. Um, an autobiography that they do for their final and in there they're going to talk about different aspects of their life but one they must speak of what a life on the reservation is like whether it be a year here or 17 years here does anyone have any questions yet anyone because I have a microphone for the questions <laughs> okay I do have we're gonna switch um, modes Um, rethinking your classroom, what it means to indigenous students uh, and non-indigenous students in Nevada. And this is a lot where we have a lot of Idaho popping in here. Um, but first, let me give you some statistics. So Idaho was established in 1890, has five reservations, all of which predate the state. Um, the Kootenai tribe, you'll find something different. The Kootenai reservation, they had a lot. They actually declared war on the United States at one point in time. <coughs> Nevada has 32 reservations and colonies. Um, the indigenous population makes up 1.7% of Nevada. 1.7%. Um, so what images come to your minds when you think of the terms redskins, savages, Indians, and braves? You don't have to answer, just think about it. Um, did anyone think of anything dated? Wait, 100 years before our time. Did anyone think of that? Anyone <coughs> think of feathers? Anything that had to do with a feather? Or maybe they were half dressed even. Um, so a lot of those images still linger. Um, I know in Idaho, they had um, a, a mural of a man that was being, a Native American man being hanged, and that hung up in the courthouse for a long time. Um, in Nevada, they're everywhere. We have the Owyhee Braves, we have the Elko Indians. So a lot of really dated imagery comes with that, uh, specifically mascots. Um, so how are these images any different than derogatory terms? like redskins, um, very dated. This top left is actually a screenshot from Teachers Pay Teachers. You type in indigenous and that's what it gives you. Um, dated, whimsical posters and elementary teachers like to do like a theme uh, that was in the Native American theme when I Googled it. So why are those images of positivity and representation so important. Um, so settler colonialism destroys in order to replace. So my, what I believe is my actuality, everyone else tells me it's not, not at all. In this picture, this video, it's hard to watch. I don't know if we have sound. We don't have sound, that's the whole part. <laughs>
sorry, that was very intense. I didn't check the volume before. Uh, so a few years ago, my brother was still in school in Idaho. <laughs> and I, he went to school at the University of Idaho. And a few years ago, the boys made it to basketball state in Las Vegas. So my brothers drove from the top of Idaho to the bottom of Nevada to watch this. <laughs> Makes me emotional, so. He went to state to be placed in a box. Those kids are not away, he kids. <laughs> Sorry, it gets me every time. And the man who's doing this, not even, I don't know who he is. He's not affiliated with our school. He's actually pretty problematic because the kids that they're playing are jackpot kids. And if you guys know about the population in jackpot, he was playing a little like head dance song when it was their ball. Okay. Um, so, well, I don't know if I could go to the next one. Okay, um, so how is your classroom cognizant of indigenous people at your school and at your community? Um, what are you telling your students about indigenous people today? Are you embedding amazing images of former Elko County Superintendent uh, Antoinette Kavanaugh, of geog geologist, geographer, uh, Autumn Harry from Pyramid Lake, um, Carrie and Mary Dan, of Carlin, Nevada. Uh, Kenneth Pete, whose greenhouse just down the road has been in the ACES magazine as top 10 native uh, STEM uh, enterprises to watch. World renowned tattoo artist from Fort Hall, Idaho, Kira Murillo. A D1 athlete that went to the NFL, Austin Corbett. 12 time state champions from Lapway, Idaho, uh, the Lapway Wildcats, or Sky Pete, whose science project from Elko County School District, or Elko County Science Fair, her science project is um, one of the uh, Angel Angeline Bully's Firekeeper's Daughter. Did you guys hear of that one? Uh, so, her science fair project is actually featured as the protagonist's like whole science spiel. Like, and she's from here. So, are you telling your students, your community, everybody, that these are people of today? That's all I have for you guys. Is that 45 minutes? Yes. Uh, I don't know if I inspired them, but I had definitely pushed a couple of kids. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I say a couple, like a handful of students have gone into education. Yeah. Any questions? I have a question or comment. Yeah. identities of communities and the students in that so that no matter what you're teaching they feel they can feel seen especially like in the book that they might not feel seen and how do we take that because mm -hmm. we have to teach it how do we take it how do we make all students in our classroom feel seen mm -hmm. that they matter and that's like a really big thing um we go from being the majority here and the moment any of my students leave this little 36 by 36, they go from to minority. And they probably won't see something of themselves. They're often mistaken as a different ethnicity. Um, my last name's Hernandez, but I could probably be very wealthy uh, if I were to have a dollar every time someone spoke Spanish to me. Um, but like we're often, we're often mistaken as other things or nobody has any idea that this little chunk of space sits here. 
so that's essentially why it's really important for me to show my students they exist in every platform, in every format. Again, um, I encourage you to take a tour of my classroom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Um, context for the state video: Our Hawaii basketball team is phenomenally every year. Is phenomenal every year, and that year when we went down there, we were at Clark High School. And we had nothing to do <laughs> with the sound selection, but because we were native kids on the floor with the mascot as the Braves, somebody was like, this is a great idea. And you know, the crowd participation was huge, including our then principal throwing his arm back and forth. Meanwhile, I know myself watching here from home was like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, Ms. Hernandez and I, we have a lot of side conversations. <laughs> We're like, did you see that? Um, the, the thought behind that, I'm sure, is well-intentioned, but um, the outcome and the way it impacts um, who we are in our spirit is tremendous. So having positive representation is really crucial. As a former teacher in Clark County, uh, I would be the teacher standing up in the, in the staff meeting say, you know, it is, you know, please don't teach Columbus Discovered America. <laughs> and I would get challenged by my colleagues and they would say, well, it's just easier that way. And I'd say, you know, you, as an educator, you are empowered to teach the truth. Not every school has a Lynn. Not every school has a toe. There are so few of us. And between toe, myself, my mother, Ms. Um, Cheryl, Ms. Hernandez, even our, our allies who continue to be here and be in support of our community, Ms. Pete, Ms. Darling, we, we have to speak up because there's only just us. <laughs> there's only just us and we're here a hundred miles from anywhere and thankful for uh, technology when it's working People have access to real and authentic native content, native ideas, native educators, and not just what teachers who are of various ethnicities put on paper, what they were taught at the time they were taught, which any time before 1990 is probably not going to be it. <laughs> so um, please seek out native educators, native content, and Utilize that before you dig into your own education to teach about things like Thanksgiving or um, Columbus Day or any type of Native heritage events. Discover who the local tribal people are and, that, and recognize that they are still there. We are still here. We continue to exist in these spaces. We blend in with the, with the mosaic of people who are present um, that we aren't often seen. But those of us who make ourselves available, please seek us out. Please seek out Ms. Hernandez for more information. Um, she and I are definitely available um, for any number of question answer or presentations or come and, you know, how, how can we help um, give the content that you would like to present um, from an authentic standpoint? <laughs> 